Welcome to lecture 14 uh, in the uh, NPTEL online uh, certification course on bioreactors. The, um, the we will begin module 4 in this lecture. Title of module 4 is cultivation parameters that affect bioreactor performance. You know, we have a lot of cultivation parameters that we can measure, we can control and so on and so forth. We had briefly seen some of these uh, when we uh, were introduced to bioreactors. Uh, and in this module, we are going to see how they affect the bioreactor performance and how we can optimize them uh, so that we can get the best out of the bioreactor. In the first uh, module, we were introduced to bioreactors, we saw the common types of bioreactors and their common modes of operation and also some sterilization kinetics including the decimal reduction time. In the second module, we, uh, we saw uh, the outcomes of the bioreactor, the two major outcomes of the bioreactor. One is the biomass or cells and the product that is made by the cells or through an enzyme reaction. We saw a lot of details on the modeling of it, uh, mathematical representations of uh, them, as well as enzyme kinetics, enzyme inhibition, and measurement of important uh, parameters such as cell concentration, substrate concentration, product concentration in bioreactors. In module 3, we looked at uh, the analysis of uh, the common modes of operation so that uh, that would be useful for some design decisions. In this module, uh, module 4, we would look at the cultivation parameters that affect bioreactor performance. The cultivation parameters are also called the bioreactor environment parameters. You know, we said that uh, the cells are the actual factories that produce the product in the bioreactor. Therefore, the parameters that affect the cellular environment or the environment in the bioreactor uh, of the cells, those are what are we, uh, those are called environmental parameters or cultivation parameters. There are many cultivation parameters that can one, one can think of. We will look at some common ones now. They are actually measured and controlled as we uh, mentioned just before. The common ones, the first obvious one is the temperature, pH of the medium, pH outside the cells of the medium, the medium composition, what the medium consists of. We have seen some aspects of this. Remember, we looked at the effect of substrate concentration and growth rate that kind of falls into this broad uh, uh, aspect. Uh, but the medium composition itself affects uh, the product formation. There are many studies in the literature that look at media optimization, this is an entire field of uh, study. There are various ways by which media are optimized. There are mathematical techniques that one can use to minimize the number of experiments that one does uh, to get at the optimum set of uh, media, uh, media parameters or media, medium composition the Plackett-Berman technique and so on and so forth. We will not look at those in this introductory lecture. Uh, it will suffice to say that medium composition does affect the, um, uh, the uh, it is one of the environmental parameters that affects the productivity of the bioreactor and a lot of work has been done on that. Aeration and agitation, we would kind of look at them together, they are two distinct aspects aeration is the rate at which air is provided into uh, the bioreactor for oxygen supply or even a mixture of oxygen and something else say nitrogen that is provided into the bioreactor for uh, uh, providing oxygen to the cells and agitation is the rate at which the agitator uh, if one is present let us say in a uh, stirred tank the agitator uh, what are its effects on the culture. They also determine other aspects which we will look at. In fact, both of them together are uh, very important for
for what is called the dissolved oxygen level do for short this is not do this is do dissolved oxygen level they are dependent on the aeration and agitation levels uh, this is so important that it is considered as a separate parameter it's measured separately and actually controlled separately through uh, manipulating aeration and agitation let us first look at temperature it's common knowledge that uh, there is some kind of an optimum temperature at which the cells work well you know our the optimum temperature for our body as we know is the normal temperature right it's uh, you all know what the normal temperature is and uh, beyond that temperature we are supposed to have fever uh, the body causes fever for certain reasons and then uh, it is brought back down to normal by many means uh, and the body functions well similarly uh, the uh, different cells function most optimally at temperatures which are which could be different for example there are certain cells which function optimally at 30 degrees c our cells mammalian cells function optimally usually at 37 degrees c and so on but the range is rather narrow it's about let's say 25 to about 37 degrees c is where most of the cells that we know of fall there are of course variations and that is what we are going to look at now in some sort of a complete picture if we look at the variation in growth rate with temperature you know we are looking at the uh, effect on growth rate remember we said how rates are important and therefore this would also focus on how the temperature affects growth rate the variation is something like this there is a temperature below which the growth cannot occur and then as the temperature is increased the growth rate increases reaches a maximum value and then falls down quite quickly in fact the rate of uh, increase with increase in temperature is slower compared to the rate of uh, decrease uh, if you take the negative of it the rate of decrease with increase in temperature so it's kind of uh, squished or skewed to one side this is called t min uh, below t minimum below which growth does not occur this is t max the maximum temperature at which growth occurs beyond which growth does not occur and it's quite uh, obvious that this is t optimum the optimum temperature at which the growth rate is maximum and we would like to usually operate at the t optimum unless we are looking at coming up with temperature based strategies by which uh, the temperature is varied in a narrow range towards various ends okay, i'll probably briefly uh, talk to you about it or maybe i can mention this we have done some work on that let us say that the growth is <coughs> optimum at a certain temperature whereas the product formation is optimum at a different temperature in fact this is what we found when we did studies on hybridoma the cells that produce monoclonal antibodies mm -hmm. they grow optimally at around 37 at 37 degrees c whereas their uh, monoclonal antibody production is optimum at around 39 degrees c so the straightforward strategy is to grow cells optimally first and then switch the temperature to 39 degrees c so that the monoclonal antibody production takes place optimally that can be done because monoclonal antibody is a secondary metabolite it is uh, it is produced in the later phase of a batch growth a secondary metabolite also goes with that so the idea is if you grow hybridoma at its optimum temperature for growth then the growth is maximized we get the <coughs> excuse me the maximum cell concentration and when the maximum cell concentration is reached the if the temperature can be switched to the optimum for monoclonal antibody production then the production goes up we already have a large number of cells or a larger number of cells compared to uh, other temperatures and uh, the total production is the amount produced by each cell 
times the total number of cells. So we have maximized the total number of cells in a particular volume. In other words, we have maximized the concentration of cells. And then by increasing the temperature, we are making each cell produce at a higher rate. Therefore, the overall productivity from the bioreactor will go up. If you are uh, looking at these strategies, uh, the temperature based strategies, uh, this information becomes rather crucial and these have already been done. They have also been used in the industry, the temperature shift strategies. Coming back to this, the range of temperatures over which uh, the growth occurs, in other words mathematically T max minus T min is called the temperature range for growth. If this range T max minus T min is narrow, uh, relatively speaking, these are all relative, we just cannot pin it down to very firm numbers. Let us say it is reasonably narrow, a few degrees, uh, then or, or a few, uh, a few degrees, uh, let us say uh, 10, 20 degrees or so, then the organism is called a stenothermal organism. If the temperature range of growth T max minus T min is broad, the, temp the growth occurs over a wide range of temperatures, let us say, then the organism is called a urethermal organism. Okay. Let us look at the variation in growth rate with temperature again. The T optimum the temperature at which the growth rate is maximum can be medium, let us say around 30 degrees C, which means the variation of growth rate in with temperature will be something like this, let us say it starts at around uh, 15 or something like that, then goes up to re reach an optimum of 30 and then falls down uh, and the growth is not possible, let us say after about 40. If this happens, if the T optimum is medium around 30 degrees C, then the organism is called a mesophile. If it is low, you know, the temperature optimum is around 15 degrees C, then the organism is called a psychrophile. Phile is something that is loving, so psychro, low temperature loving, meso, mid temperature loving. And there is one more, if it is high, let us say this is around 60 degrees, it is not 30, it is 60 degrees, then it is called a thermophile. Okay, let us probably correct it right now so that you will not get the wrong picture. Okay, around 60 degrees C, it is called a thermophile. Most organisms that we use in the industry are mesophiles because it is much easier for temperature maintenance. You know, there is a lot of effort that goes into maintaining low temperatures, a lot of effort that goes into maintaining high temperatures energy wise, effort wise and so on. So unless the product is exotic and has a huge market, the uh, psychrophiles or thermophiles are not normally used. Usually the mesophiles are the ones that are predominantly used in the industry. Okay. There is another adjective that we should become familiar with that is obligate or facultative. Okay. They go hand in hand, obligate on one side, facultative on the other side. What does that mean? Obligate means strict and facultative means flexible. This can be used in any context. We will introduce it in the context of temperature. For example, obligate thermophile, okay, strict thermophiles. Strict thermophiles will grow only at high temperatures. They will not grow at room temperatures or they will not grow at temperatures that are not their optimum or that are not high. Okay, That is what obligate thermophiles mean. Whereas facultative thermophiles may grow at room temperature but at very low growth rates. They will still grow but their growth rates of course will not be the optimum. That will be much lower than the optimum 
but they will at least grow. Okay, so they are somewhat flexible. They can adapt to the lower temperature conditions or they can multiply under the lower temperature conditions, but at much slower rates. You could uh, use this um, adjectives for very many different situations. For example, uh, an aerobe, an oxygen requiring organism. If it is an obligate aerobe, then it will grow only in the presence of oxygen. It will be unable to grow in the absence of oxygen. Whereas a facultative aerobe can grow well in the presence of oxygen, whereas it can also grow in the absence of oxygen. So it can be used in several different contexts. Going forward, the following equation can be used to quantify the effect of temperature on growth rate. Uh, something similar to what we had seen earlier in one such situation, but this is in a different context. Rx, the volumetric rate of uh, uh, cell growth equals a mu dash minus kd dash times the cell concentration x. Okay. Some kind of a constant times x, a first order rate expression. The constant in itself has two parts, mu dash minus kd dash, where mu dash is given by an arrhenius expression a exponential minus e g by r t. e g is the activation energy for growth. You know, this is an Arne typical arrhenius form. So, the temperature dependence has been brought in here, right. So, mu dash is a function of temperature and if e g is known, one can even predict what its specific growth rate will be at a different temperature. And k d dash is some a, uh, a dash uh, which is different from a exponential minus e d times divided by r t. R t. The activation energy for growth is typically in the 10 to 20 kilocal per mole range. Okay, that is a nice number to know to, to be able to predict back of the back of the envelope what would be the effect of temperature on growth rate 10 to 20 kilocalories per mole. Whereas the activation energy for death here E d is 60 to 80 kilocalories per mole. So, this is some sort of a mathematical model which gives us the effect of uh, temperature on the growth rate of the organism. Okay, this we have already seen. Okay. We have already seen that high temperatures can be used to sterilize bioreactors. Okay. We did go through quite a bit of uh, analysis on that. We did a problem on that to better understand uh, how the temperature affects the cells in the context of killing all the cells. Low temperatures, that is high temperature, low temperatures can be used for preservation of cells in an inanimate state which can be revived when necessary. Okay. Such a process is actually called cryopreservation. You might ask where is it really relevant? Why do you want to preserve cells? It is a very common question. You know, if you think about it, it becomes very necessary. There are so many cell lines and strains that are used for production and research, some of which have been modified for a certain purpose and so on. And how do you ensure that goes on? Right? So, what is done is some cells are <coughs> in a good amount of some cells with uh, desirable properties after uh, they have been modified to uh, give those desirable properties are actually stored in an inanimate state at low temperatures, at liquid nitrogen temperatures in fact. And um, low temperature is used for maintaining those cells in an, in, an, in, in an inanimate state and when needed they can be revived for uh, production also as well as for research. A lot of research depends on the availability of uh, cell lines at a certain state. Right? In fact, uh, that becomes very crucial for the even the um, even maintaining the research in some labs. Uh, whenever the power goes down, one of the biggest concerns is that is the minus 80 degree C uh, refrigerator is, is that a freezer, is, is that uh, going to be going to get affected. When we designed our buildings, we had to ensure that uh, we had dedicated power lines 
which were supported by uh, the UPSs and so on, so that they would be continuous power to those minus 80 degree C freezers. So it is rather crucial and it is done all the time. Sperm banks, this is an example that uh, many can relate to quite easily. Uh, there the uh, sperms are maintained in an inanimate state at using low temperatures to be used when needed. And even whole humans have been uh, uh, kept in some sort of an animated state immediately after their death and so on and so forth. There are various ways in which they go about doing that. The idea is that uh, probably somebody is just about dying from a disease for which there is no cure now. Maybe there will be a cure in the future and therefore if the person is maintained in an inanimate state, you know, very carefully, uh, uh, the, the procedure is very carefully done and so on and uh, it is a hugely expensive kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, in a proposition. And uh, hopefully when uh, a cure is available, probably the person can be brought back to life and then the disease state cured is some of the uh, justifications given for such process, but they are all real. In fact, I am going to give you some videos. Let me tell you what videos they are. Number 17 here in your file, cryopreservation of adherent mammalian cells. This is a nice video to look at how to how to maintain or cryopreserve uh, mammalian cells that are used for research, production and so on. Number 18 is whole body preservation. Right? You can click on these links and watch these short videos to gain a better understanding as to these processes. They are very interesting. those are the videos that we talked about. The liquid nitrogen temperatures, very low temperatures are needed for long term storage and it is absolutely crucial that those temperatures are maintained throughout. Also the rates of cooling when the cells are taken from let us say room temperature down to liquid nitrogen temperature, the rates of cooling, the rate at which you reach those temperatures needs to be very carefully uh, monitored, uh, it is difficult to monitor them, but it needs to be carefully done according to set procedures so as to avoid ice formation inside the cytoplasm. We all know that uh, ice is uh, or water H2O is a strange chemical in the sense that uh, the density of the solid is less than the density of liquid. In fact, the maximum temperature of H2O is at around 4 degrees C. So since the density is smaller of ice compared to the density of liquid, the volume of ice is larger than the volume of liquid. And if ice forms inside the cell due to the water freezing inside the cell, it can even break open the cells. So that is a real danger and therefore the rate of cooling needs to be uh, kept in mind and uh, set procedures used and some other methods used to prevent ice break, it, uh, ice damage when cooling is done. In fact, an interesting outcome of uh, the lower density of ice is that ice forms on uh, top of lakes and so on in winter in cold countries and you can people skate on ice and so on. In fact, the solid is on top, the water below is actually liquid and that actually allows for life to exist even at low temperatures because uh, ice is formed that prevents further uh, cooling and so on um, and it is actually a solid which floats on top of water. There are these very interesting things that happen in nature, biology and so on. To minimize ice damage, some chemicals are used such as DMSO dimethyl sulfoxide, serum albumin or dextran and so on. Okay. So if temperature is so important, it needs to be controlled 
in the bioreactor at the optimum point which is should be the set point. For example, if somebody is growing mammalian cells in a bioreactor, the set point would be 37 degrees C. If somebody is growing yeast cells in a bioreactor, maybe 30 degrees C. If some bacteria uh, grow at 37 degrees C, some bacteria at say 30 degrees C, 28 degrees C and so on, some algae, microalgae at 25 degrees C. So, the temperature could vary. In any case, once the organism is chosen, the temperature needs to be controlled at its optimum level, uh, at the optimum level for its growth in the bioreactor or at the level that is desired in the bioreactor if you are doing the temperature shift strategies and so on. Temperature, if you need to control, you first need to measure it, right. The temperature is usually measured by a resistance temperature device, RTD device and recorded electronically. The thermometer can be used for a small scale kind of a thing uh, and so on if for manual readout, but uh, here you need to continuously uh, work on the temperature control and that is typically done electronically uh, through a control loop and so on. For that they should, uh, the manual intervention would be difficult and uh, in such cases the measurement is done by a resistance temperature device, the NRTD device. Heat is generated by cellular processes because of the metabolism that occurs in the cell, many processes that occur in the cell and therefore, the bioreactor can generate heat and because it is generating heat, uh, it needs to be removed effectively to maintain the temperature and that is usually done by circulating water in a jacket around the bioreactor. You have a bioreactor vessel, let's say, say cylindrical vessel, concentric to that cylindrical vessel you have another uh, container with, through which water can be circulated at appropriate temperatures to maintain the temperature of the bioreactor contents. That is the way the temperature is maintained. It is a little difficult to have heating by an element, by an electrical element or something like that because the heating element would reach very high temperatures and cells that come in contact with that heating element could be dead uh, if such a, such a system is used to maintain temperature. It is not normally done. Usually it is done through uh, control of the jacket water temperature. If the temperature set point is higher than the ambient, let us say 37 degrees C is definitely higher than the ambient and the metabolic heat is unable to provide sufficient uh, heat to maintain temperature, then the bioreactor contents need to be heated. Okay. The water circulation in the jacket again works for this very effectively. Schematically from a control point of view, the bioreactor is shown here, the temperature is measured through RTD device, RTD. Uh, resistance temperature device and this is measured and controlled therefore, this is the control variable, temperature is the control variable. Whatever is measured is transmitted through a transmitter to a controller which has in it the set point uh, set, in other words it 37 degrees C is set here that is represented by the set point. Therefore, the controller takes action so, as the set point is maintained in the bioreactor, it takes action in this particular case by changing the jacket water temperature that is circulated in the jacket of the bioreactor to control the temperature and therefore, the jacket water temperature is the manipulated variable. This is a straightforward temperature control. Uh, this is uh, uh, prime, this is uh, fundamental or basic uh, control that one looks into if somebody is interested in control of systems. And this is a classic way of representing the uh, controlled variable and manipulated variable which are terms that are used in the control literature. Okay. That I think is good uh, information on temperature for us. Let us look at the second variable which is the pH of the medium. 
the pH uh, as a first approximation is the negative of the logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration. Uh, the hydrogen ion concentration in the medium uh, could be measured and uh, that gives us the pH. The medium pH significantly affects growth and there is an optimal value of pH that we can expect. For bacteria, the optimal pH, uh, the pH over which uh, growth can occur without much effect is actually very broad. It can grow well between 3 and 8, a pH of 3 and 8. Okay. For uh, fungi, it is let us say between 3 and 7, whereas mammalian se cells are very strict. There, um, they can grow only if the medium pH is between 6.5 to 7.5. In fact, if it goes below 6.5, it does not grow. If it goes above 7.5, it does not grow. So, the medium has some special uh, dyes added to it, phenol red, that uh, indicates the pH by its color. In fact, if uh, the medium had become pink, then we know that the temperature, has, the pH has become too high, possibly the cells are dead. If it becomes orange due to acid formation, it has gone below, let us say, 6.5. Uh, 8 and so on and so forth and uh, so we need to worry about it. Even in the lab we use this, phenol red is normally ad added to many mammalian cell media such as DMEM and so on to give a visual indication of the pH. Plant cells are again reasonably strict 5 to 6 and different types of cells are sensitive to different extents to a change in pH. Bacteria and fungi can withstand reasonably large pH changes as can be shown here. Mammalian cells are highly sensitive to pH changes as we just mentioned. They just won't grow. The metabolism in the cell, the set of uh, reactions in the cell causes acids to form. Lactic acid is a very common byproduct of the mammalian cell metabolism. And that gets secreted out of the cells and that can reduce the medium pH. And um, if this happens, the medium acidifies. And even alkalinization can happen in many different situations due to related but different phenomena. You know, the uh, uh, carbonic acid is used uh, while controlling pH and uh, so on even for cultivation um, of microalgae, you know, the photosynthetic microalgae, you have carbon dioxide in the air that dissolves, produces carbonic acid and that carbonic acid buffer system is used for, um, uh, in, is, is a part of the process while growing microalgae in bioreactors. pH measurement and control, it is measured through a probe the principle is electrochemical. In fact, the principle is very nice. Uh, I have given you a, a video for that. Might take some time in this lecture. Let, us, let me just point you out to a video, which is a nice video, which gives you the principle of pH measurement through a pH probe. The pH measurement number 19, you can go and take a look at that. Probe will of course be in contact with the medium and therefore it needs to be sterile. It cannot have organisms on it, otherwise the medium will get affected. Therefore, the probe is sterilized uh, before use along with the medium itself it is sterilized whenever the bioreactor, whenever it is used in a bioreactor. And uh, the usually the probes that are associated, associated with the bioreactor are autoclavable. Many probes are not. For example, the pH probe that you use in the lab for measuring the pH of solutions that is not usually autoclavable. The control of pH, you know, if the pH goes up, then it needs to be brought down. If the pH goes down, it needs to be brought up. Happens through addition of an acid or a base as needed to maintain the broth pH. Okay. So, it is controlled, then the there are two uh, vessels, one containing an acid, one containing a base and what to add that decision is made and acid or a base is added to maintain the pH at a particular set point. One can always ask, you know, there are these so called buffers 
phosphate buffers, acetate buffer and so on, so citrate buffer and so on, which are designed to withstand huge changes, huge assaults to their pH value and they maintain the pH value at that set point uh, through the chemical mechanisms. You know, they are, uh, uh, they contain substances which can counteract the effect of either acid addition or base addition to maintain the pH the same. Okay, they are used in very, very many different analyses. Why can't these cells be grown in buffers and so the pH uh, control becomes, uh, is be uh, becomes obviated, you know, you don't need pH control if you grow them in buffers. That's uh, one of the questions that can come up. In fact, we have done some work on that. We have tried growing cells in buffers. We didn't find literature, so we, could, we did not know uh, whether it had been done. Uh, so we went ahead and grew cells in buffers. And to a surprise, we found that they don't grow in buffers at all. Okay, so they, they don't grow because ionic strength of the medium is an important uh, environmental variable uh, or an environmental variable for cultivation. And the ionic strength there is very different in buffers. Okay, that's probably the reason why they don't grow. Uh, so you cannot use common buffers to, in the medium to grow cells. The schematic for pH control is something like this. pH is the controlled variable which is measured through the pH probe. The pH value which is measured electrically, electrochemically is sent to the transmitter, the transmitter to the controller. There is a set point which is optimal for the cultivation that is set here. Actions are taken to manipulate the acid or the base flow rate. That is what is the manipulated variable here into the bioreactor to maintain the pH at a preset value. Okay. Let us very briefly see agitation and aeration in this lecture and then we can look at the details in the next lecture. Agitation of the bioreactor contents is needed to keep uh, the contents in suspension as well as to provide enough oxygen um, and which is achieved through the impellers and so on. There are two videos on mixing and impellers which give more information on agitation. Let me point them out to you. You can go and uh, see them yourself. The mixing, this is controls in a lab scale bioreactor. This is also a useful video. This is it goes along with the earlier thing. This gives you all the controls in a lab scale bioreactor. It is not a very high quality video, but it gives you an idea of what there is. Uh, number 21 is on mixing and number 22 is on the various types of impellers. You may want to see these videos to get an idea, better idea of mixing, to get details on the mixing phenomenon and details on impellers and so on. The impeller RPM is controlled at a fixed value in most stirred tank reactors, bioreactors. The RPM, which is the measured variable, is measured using what are called tachometers and controlled by varying the power to the rotating shaft. So the power to the rotating shaft is the manipulated variable. And we have already seen in module 1 that aeration is used to agitate bioreactor contents in airlift bioreactors, not just agitation, not just agitators. You could also use aeration to agitate, to keep, uh, to mix the contents of the bioreactor to keep them in suspension and so on. In addition, aeration is used to provide oxygen to aerobic cells. Aeration is measured through flow rate measurement using gas flow meters as they are called. Rotameters and mass flow controllers are commonly used. Rotameters need to be controlled manually, whereas mass flow controllers can be controlled electronically through automatic control. There are uh, a couple of videos that I would like to s like you to see on the rotameter and the mass flow controller. Uh, the mass flow controller principle is very interesting. Let me point out those videos to you. You know, number 23 gives you the video for the rotameter, number 24 for the mass flow controller. You may want to see them. And agitation and aeration levels together 
both are manipulated variables, are used to controlled, control the dissolved oxygen levels at certain desired values. Okay? So, when you are looking at DO control, then agitation and aeration levels become the manipulated variables. They themselves are controlled uh, and uh, monitored and controlled, but uh, they taken together also affect, uh, also determine the DO value. They agitation and aeration can also cause shear on cells, shear stress on cells. We will look at that in some detail later. Okay. And when we meet the next time, uh, or yeah, in the next lecture, we will look at the details of um, DO control, DO first, what, what it does and then control of DO and also shear stress on cells. Okay. See you then.